The story begins in A.D. 33. Saul of Tarsus, also known as Paul of Tarsus, is persecuting a new sect of Jews who are following Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified four years earlier. Saul is his Jewish name. Paul is his Roman name. He is a Pharisee from the extreme wing of the Pharisaical party. That wing would be the equivalent of ISIS today. What Paul was to Judaism, ISIS is to Islam. He was a rabbi. He was full of zeal in the spirit of Phineas and Elijah who inflicted violence on those who would depart or pervert the law of Moses. They would afflict violence on Jewish apostates and Jews who departed from the Mosaic traditions. For that reason, Paul is ravaging the church in Jerusalem. He's invading their homes. He's pulling men and women out of their homes and taking them to prison. And he's also consenting to the death of some of these Jewish believers in Jesus. And one of them, he consented to his stoning. Because of the persecution, the Jerusalem church disperses all throughout Palestine. And there are churches planted wherever these believers go. Which is interesting because Paul was planting churches before he became an apostle. <laughs> before he became a Christian. <laughs> That's what persecution does. Some of the believers who dispersed head all the way up to Syria to a city called Damascus. And there's a church planted there. And Paul gets permission from the high priest to hunt the Jewish believers in Jesus wherever they are. And he gets permission to go to Damascus and track them down there to persecute them. But on his way to Damascus, he has a head-on collision with Jesus of Nazareth, ascended in heaven, glorified. He has a clash with the one he's persecuting. And Jesus reveals himself in Paul and to Paul. He reveals himself in Paul and to Paul, and he commissions him to preach him the Messiah, Jesus, to the Gentiles. Shortly after this cataclysmic conversion, Paul joins the brothers and sisters who are meeting in Damascus. And he starts preaching in the synagogues that Jesus is the Messiah. And rumors spread all over Judea that the man who once was persecuting the faith is now preaching it. Some of the believers don't buy it. They think he's a spy for the Pharisees. Is he for real or not? But some did believe it, and they glorified God because of the report. Well, Saul does something very interesting. Paul, his name is Paul also, as you know. He follows in Elijah's footsteps. When Elijah was in a crisis in his life, he went to Arabia. And so Paul vanishes to Arabia. And he probably stays there for three years. And while he's in Arabia, the Lord Jesus Christ unfolds himself to Paul through the Old Testament scriptures. Paul gets his gospel and his understanding of Christ directly from Jesus while he's in Arabia. And as I say, I think he's probably there for three years. And I personally believe that those three years correspond to the three years when the twelve were mentored and discipled by Jesus. Only Paul is given his gospel and his message directly from Jesus in the Spirit. Paul then heads to Damascus. He begins preaching in the synagogues again. The Jews plot to kill him and he escapes and he heads to Jerusalem for the first time. And he meets with Peter 
the apostle, the great apostle, for 15 days in Jerusalem. And I have a notion that he wanted to know what it was like living with Jesus Christ when he was on earth. The only other apostle he met with was James, the Lord's half-brother. But that's really all that we know about that visit. He didn't meet with any of the other apostles. He spent 15 days with Peter. And the Jews find out that he is there, that he's been converted to this new sect, the Jesus followers. And so the brethren get him out of town and he goes back to his hometown in Tarsus in Cilicia. He will spend five to six years there. Now, some of the Christians who dispersed from the persecution, they hit a Gentile city way up there in Syria called Antioch. Antioch of Syria. It's the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And scores of Gentiles are getting saved for the first time. I mean massive numbers. And the Jerusalem church hears about it. And remember, in the Jerusalem church, they're all Jews there who come to Christ. They get word, Peter's hands are full, John's hands are full, and so they send Barnabas, Jewish brother in the Jerusalem church, to go check it out. He gets there and he's blown away. All these Greeks, all these Gentiles are coming to Christ, and they don't, they don't know about the law. They're free. And so he stays there and begins to minister to that new church. And then he remembers Paul. Paul speaks Greek. Paul grew up in Tarsus, a Gentile city. And that Paul was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So Barnabas goes all the way to Tarsus and finds Paul and brings him back. And Paul will now spend time in the church of Antioch with Barnabas sharing the things of Christ to these new converts who are mostly Gentiles. And at this point, Paul is an underling of Barnabas. Now we move to the year 44 AD. And some of the Jewish believers in Jerusalem visit the church in Antioch. And one of them is a prophet named Agabus. And Agabus receives a revelation from the Holy Spirit that there's going to be a famine coming that's going to sweep through the entire Roman Empire. And this concerns the believers, especially those in Jerusalem, because the Jerusalem church has been suffering from chronic poverty for a long time. If a famine hits, that's it. They're done. Many of the people will starve. Let's fast forward to 47 AD. This is 14 years after Paul has been converted. 14 years. The church in Antioch decides that they're going to raise money to help their poor saints in Jerusalem. It's a beautiful thing. Gentile Christians helping Jewish Christians. So they raise the money and they send the money with Paul and Barnabas who then make the trip down to Jerusalem to give the money to the elders of the church there. And they also take a young brother named Titus, who's part of the church in Antioch. Titus is a Gentile. They bring him because they want a Gentile representative of the church in Antioch to come to Jerusalem and be part of the famine relief. So they hand the money over, and then there's a private meeting, and this is very important. There is a private meeting that takes place between Paul and Barnabas, Titus is there, and some of the elders in the Jerusalem church, and three of the heavy hitters in the Jerusalem church, Peter, James, the Lord's half-brother, and John. They're regarded as the pillars. And Paul meets with them privately because he wants to present to them the gospel that he's been preaching for these 14 years to make sure that it's in line with what Peter, James, and John are preaching and the rest of the Jerusalem apostles. Because he doesn't want to run in vain and preach something different. He wants to make sure they're in harmony. Well, a wonderful thing happens. Peter, James, and John listen to Paul roll out his gospel. They recognize the grace of God on him. They recognize the calling of God on him. And they say, 
The gospel is the same as what we preach. But since you're called to the Gentiles, you and Barnabas bring that gospel to the Gentiles, and we, Peter, Paul, and James, or Peter, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Peter, <laughs> Peter, James, and John, we will bring the gospel to the Jews. Same gospel, two different audiences. They just tell Paul, you know, you've come here to relieve the saints in Jerusalem, but I don't want you to forget them. There's thousands of them. Please remember us, poor saints in Jerusalem. And that was already in Paul's heart. He was eager to continue to do that. And he did that the rest of his life. Well, something happens in this private meeting. Something goes wrong. Somehow, some of the ex-Pharisees from the Jerusalem church got into that meeting. These are hard, legalistic men who used to be Pharisees, but the Phariseeism hasn't drained out of their bloodstream yet, even though they're part of the Jerusalem church. And Paul sees their presence in this meeting as an intrusion. He feels that they have been smuggled in secretly as spies. One of the apostles or one of the elders brought them in there. We don't know who. And they start making a fuss that Titus is not circumcised. They were there in Paul's mind to spy on their liberty the Gentiles and Antioch had, and Titus being one of them. They heard that Titus was going to be there. They wanted to see if he was circumcised. And they made a big deal that he wasn't circumcised. And Paul and Barnabas withstood them. They stood their ground, and they didn't give in to their arguments, not even for a moment. And the beautiful thing is, is that Peter, James, and John stood with Paul. They did not compel Titus to be circumcised. They also, and this is important, recognized that not only was the gospel that Jesus gave directly to Paul authentic in the same gospel they preached, but they didn't change the gospel that Paul preached. They didn't modify it. They didn't add to it. They didn't remove anything from it. This is important. Well, that meeting is over, and Paul, Barnabas, and Titus head back to Jerusalem, and they take with them a young man in the Jerusalem church, they take him back to Antioch. Paul, Barnabas, and Titus head back to Antioch of Syria from Jerusalem, and they take with them a young man who's in the Jerusalem church. He is Barnabas' cousin. Does anybody know his name? John Mark. John Mark, in the future, fast forward, he will write a book called The Gospel of Mark which is about the life of Jesus, and he will base it on Peter's records and Peter's time with the Lord. Anyway, that's in the future. Right now, he's a young man. We're still in the year 47 AD, and there is a historical prayer meeting. I wish our prayer meetings were like this today, all of them. Many prayer meetings in Christianity today, from, from my experience and, and observation, are snooze fests. This one was not. Some teachers and prophets from the Antioch Church get together and they begin to pray and worship the Lord. They've been fasting. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit speaks and says, separate Paul and Barnabas to the work I've called them to. And so the brothers in that prayer meeting lay hands on Paul and Barnabas and send them out to the apostolic work. And from henceforth, Paul and Barnabas are called apostles, sent ones. Both. So now they're going to go on a trip, and they're going to get on a ship and head south to the island of Cyprus, Barnabas' home land, his native land, and they take with them John Mark, who is their attendant, probably carries their bags. He's also an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus, which comes in handy if you're preaching the gospel about Jesus. <laughs> 
And you're going to say he's still alive? Well, here, here's a young man, listen to him. He saw him after he was resurrected. And they go through the island of Cyprus and they preach the gospel and churches are planted and Paul gets persecuted in one place. He is tied to a pillar and his back is torn asunder by 39 lashes. And uh, that pillar still exists. You can visit it today. And I'm hearing music. Unless it's in my head. <laughs> uh, there's persecution, there are churches planted, and now, now it gets interesting. Now they get on a ship and they head north. And let me tell you the story of why and what provoked it. While they're in Cyprus, they meet a governor named Sergius Paulus. And Sergius Paulus comes to Christ and he tells Paul and Barnabas, you know, I have some relatives north of here in the land of South Galatia. And they need to hear the gospel. But Paul also is very sick at this point. Something is wrong with him. We don't know what. Scholars have argued about what it may be, but he's sick. And Sergius says, Paul also, it would be good for you to go to South Galatia because it's north, it's high land, and the high altitude will help your sickness. So Paul and Barnabas pray about it and they agree. So they get on a ship with John Mark and they now sail to a land called Perga, which is inland, on their way up north to South Galatia. And there is a shipwreck. And Barnabas loses much of the luggage. John Mark can't handle it. Paul's sickness increases. He catches ammonia because he's just spent a night and a day in the deep. And finally they land and it's not looking pretty. And John Mark is so upset by the whole thing that he comes down with, I want to go home syndrome. And so John Mark heads back to Jerusalem. And Paul gets, I don't like John Mark syndrome. <laughs> because he views it as desertion. So now the two apostles are on their own, and now they have to climb up the rugged Taurus Mountains to get up to South Galatia. And it is not an easy trip. There are robbers peppered all throughout the roads, and they probably get robbed. Finally, they get up to South Galatia, Paul of Arnold, and they hit a town, city actually, it's a Roman colony called Antioch of Pisidia. Don't confuse it with Antioch of Syria. This is in South Galatia, Antioch of Pisidia. And they will preach the gospel in the synagogues, and then they will go to the Gentiles, and some of the people believe the gospel, and the church is raised up, but then the Jews come and persecute them, and they legally banish them from the city. And part of the legal banishment is they get beaten with birch rocks. So Paul's already had his back lashed 39 times. He's been flogged. He is sick. And now he gets beaten with birth rods. But a church is raised up, heavy on the Gentile side, some Jews, and the disciples of Jesus in this church are filled with the Holy Spirit and joy. For the first time, they have blessing and joy. Paul and Barnabas head south. They hit a town called Iconium. And many, many Jews and Greeks are saved. But they get run out of town again, but they leave a church behind in Iconium. But again, we're in South Galatia. They head south and they hit a little town called Lystra. And they preach the gospel in Lystra and there's a young man there who gets saved. He's half Jew, half Gentile. His name is? Timothy. Timothy. Well, Paul gets stoned in Lystra. And God miraculously heals him. And normal people, when they get stoned, they go back home and they give up. Paul doesn't do that. He, he keeps moving and they head down to a little town called Derby. And they preach the gospel there and they raise up a church. Four churches in South Galatia, Antioch of the city, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. They will spend three to four months with each of those churches, raising the church up, laying the foundation. 
giving those people the Lord Jesus Christ, showing them how to meet, showing them how to take care of one another, three to four months. Let me tell you, and this is important, what they present to them while they're there, and because we have clues when we look at the letters, especially Galatians. Paul gives them his testimony. He tells them he used to persecute the Jewish churches in Judea, particularly Jerusalem, beyond measure. He unveils to them God's eternal purpose. He shows them how to live by the life of Christ. He teaches them that Christ lives in them by the Spirit, and he shows them how to nourish themselves on spiritual things. And he uses the term sowing to the Spirit. He teaches them how to sow to the Spirit. He also talks to them about the kingdom of God and he tells them if they continue in their pagan fleshly life as a practice, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he gives that little warning. I want you to know too that Paul came there sick and whatever his sickness was, it was visible on his face and or his hands. People wore, wore long togas in that day. But they could see that something was wrong with him. There was some kind of disfiguring. And even though he was hard to look at, and that day if you were sick, God was punishing him, they received him like an angel. They looked past whatever it was. By the way, I'm not making this up. This is in the New Testament. <laughs> they looked past whatever it was. They received him like an angel. No, they even received him as if he was Jesus. Well, Paul and Barnabas are finished. They circle back up from Derby to Lystra to Iconium to Antioch of Pisidia. And they spend a few weeks with each of the churches and they do two things. They warn them that they're going to suffer. And they tell them, we enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation. So they talk to them about suffering. And these churches were all born in fire. They had persecution hitting them from the Jewish communities where they lived, who hated Paul. They had persecution coming from their pagan neighbors, because now they had left all that to follow this man, Jesus. They do something else. They lay hands on some of the seasoned brothers in all those churches, and they basically tell them, if there's a crisis, you guys help handle it. Those are called elders in South Galatia. Let's look at who these believers are very quickly. Let's take the church in Antioch of Pisidia, okay? One of the Galatian churches. Let's say there are 100 people there in that church. 50 are God-fearing Gentiles. God-fearers were Gentiles who went to the synagogue and they believed in the God of Israel, but they weren't circumcised. But they were familiar with the Old Testament scriptures because they went to the synagogue. So 50 of them are God-fearing Gentiles. 30 of them are pagan Gentiles. They don't know anything about the law of Moses. But they are part of the religious culture, and they're Phrygians, and Phrygians have a very strict and moralistic pagan religion. So 30 of them are pagan Gentiles who are Phrygians, and then 20 of them are Jews. Now listen, out of those 100 people, only five could read, and only two could write. And they have no Bibles because the New Testament hasn't been written yet. And the Old Testament is very scarce. They don't have religious buildings, they meet in homes. But as I say, most of them are Gentiles. Now Paul and Barnabas head back to Antioch of Syria, their hometown, and they rest. They rest for about a year. And they rest because raising up a church is incredibly exhausting. It will take everything out of you so apostles must recharge their batteries. They rest for about a year. And here's where it gets real interesting. They give a report to the brothers and sisters in Antioch of Syria, most of whom are Gentiles, and they tell them about what God did in South Galatia and the four churches, and they all rejoice, and everything is wonderful. And then the church of Antioch says, let's invite the big apostle to come honor us with his presence. 
So they send word to Jerusalem and they say, we want to extend a personal invitation for Peter to come visit us. Now you have to understand, in that time, Peter was the man. He was the chief apostle whom Jesus selected. He opened the door to the kingdom of God to the Jews on Pentecost. He opened the door to the kingdom of God to the Gentiles in the house of Cornelius. And he's known for signs and wonders. I mean, you can walk past him and his shadow will heal you. He is the man. So Peter accepts the invitation. He comes into Antioch. They have a big blowout meeting and a banquet. And he's just loving what he sees. You know, he was the first one to bring the gospel to Gentiles. And here's a bunch of Gentiles, law-free, happy, rejoicing, joyous Gentiles. And, you know, it's a big church. There's, there's hundreds of believers there, and they have meals together in big banquet halls, and the Jews eat with the Gentiles, and everybody's one happy family. But something happens. Word gets back to the church in Jerusalem that Peter is eating with Gentiles. And to the Jews of that time, that's a scandal. You don't do that. And, you know, the church in Jerusalem is trying to convert unbelieving Jews in the city. These unbelieving Jews are hearing that Peter, one of, the, one of these guys, are trying to tell us about this Jesus. He's eating with Gentiles. We don't want to hear from anybody who does that. And then the ex-Pharisees who are in the church in Jerusalem, they're just blowing their court because that's horrible. So, some of the ex-Pharisees who were in that private meeting when Paul and Barnabas visited Jerusalem, and let me just say this parenthetically, Paul, when he met them in that private meeting, they were smuggled in, as he put it, he concluded that these are not real Christians. These are not true believers. These are false brethren. They claim they know Jesus, but they don't. They're just hardcore legalists. Pretty big conclusion to reach. Well, these same guys go to James, the Lord's half-brother, and they say, Peter has, has been eating with Gentiles. It's creating a scandal. Here among many of us in the church in Jerusalem, and also the unbelieving Jews are getting word of it, and it's hampering our evangelistic efforts. Would you send us a letter of recommendation so we can just tell Peter what's going on? And James says, okay, I'll do that. He writes the letter, he sends the men off to Antioch of Syria, which is about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. So the men get there, the ex-Pharisees, the legalists. And at first they're quiet. They visit with Peter. They meet the saints. They're polite. They sit there in the meetings, observe. And then one day they take Peter aside privately and say, listen, we have a problem. Word has come to Jerusalem that you're eating with Gentiles and it's creating all kinds of problems. It's scandalous. You need to stop doing that. You're putting the apostles, your other apostle brothers, in danger hurting their evangelistic efforts. You need to stop. And you know, Peter, I love Peter. Peter is one of my heroes. But like all heroes, he had a weakness. And his weaknesses was he wanted to please men and he, he tended to be afraid at times. And so he feared these people, these men from Jerusalem. They were very powerful men. If you met them, try to imagine the most intense personalities you've ever come across. Intimidating. Paul called these men, these ex-Pharisees, those of the circumcision party because they believed that all Gentiles must be circumcised and obey the law of Moses. These were hard men, intimidating men. And Peter feared he didn't want to offend them. He didn't want to offend his Jewish brothers in Jerusalem who were more conservative. So mealtime comes, and Peter, who's been eating with the Gentiles, withdraws, and he sits at a table with the Jews. And other Jews come. 
and eat with him. And other Jews who are sitting with Gentiles, they see what's going on, and they move away from the Gentiles and start eating with their Jewish brothers and sisters. And basically, in a short period of time, you now have a segregated church where only the Jews are eating with the Jews and the Gentiles are eating with the Gentiles. It's kind of like a high school cafeteria at lunchtime where you have the cliques, right? Jocks are over here, cheerleaders here, you know, this race there, that race there. And even Barnabas, Barnabas looks up to Peter. You know, he lived with him in Jerusalem for years. For all we know, Peter led Barnabas to the Lord. He looks up to this man. And so even he withdraws from the Gentiles and eats with the Jews. Paul's out of town when this is going on. He's not around. He gets back into town. It's mealtime. Paul walks in and he sees what's happening. And the air is charged. And everybody can see the fury in Paul's eyes. And he walks over to the table where the Gentiles are eating. And he says, Hand me the shrimp, the lobster, and the pork. <laughs> and with a full plate of unclean foods, he walks over to the table where Peter is. And Paul of Tarsus sticks his finger under Peter's nose and he reads the riot act to him. He tears into him. Now remember, Paul is a junior apostle right now. Peter is the chief apostle. He rebukes Peter publicly in front of everybody. And those ex-Pharisee legalists are watching the whole drama play out. Well, what's interesting is we know exactly what Paul said. Paul quotes the last part of Galatians chapter 2 to Peter as he rebukes him. He just hasn't written it yet. <laughs> but he tells us what he said to him. And although Peter had a weakness for pleasing men and being afraid of men, he, he receives the rebuke. And the next day Peter goes home. But the Judaizing, ex-Pharisee, legalistic, men from Jerusalem who had letters from James are still there and there's a meeting and they stand up and say Paul was wrong in what he did and he said not only is it right for Jews not to eat with Gentiles but Gentiles need to be circumcised in order to be saved and then Jews and Gentiles can eat together. And Paul and Barnabas get word of this and they have this vehement argument with these legalistic men from Jerusalem. And it's a, it's a blowout. Well, I want to tell you what these men do from Jerusalem. And before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about them. They are being led by one ringleader who's there. We don't know his name because Paul never mentions him by name, but he's referred to a lot. And what he will do, this man, is he will follow wherever Paul of Tarsus goes. He will visit every church that Paul plants in the Gentile world with a specific goal of undermining Paul's ministry, discrediting Paul, and laying the law of Moses and circumcision on all the Gentiles. And I believe that when Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he's referring to this man. And he is every bit the equal of Paul in zeal in dedication, in gifting. He is smart, he's articulate, he's persuasive. He's a powerful man. Never underestimate this man, whoever he is. And here he is in Antioch of Syria, telling the Gentiles they need to be circumcised. And Paul goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. Well, 
That argument ends, the smoke starts to settle, and what this man does, this ex-Pharisee legalist, he gets his little group together, and instead of going back to Jerusalem, you know where they go? Galatia, where Paul and Barnabas had been. Because they heard the reports that Paul and Barnabas brought the gospel to all these Gentiles in South Galatia. They make a long, horrendous trip to Galatia. For what purpose? To undermine everything Paul did. To trash Paul so that they can bring the wonderful, glorious law of Moses on these Gentiles and get those Gentiles circumcised. And they head out there. So they get there. And they say, we are from the church in Jerusalem. We live with the 12 apostles. Wow, really? We even have this letter from James. He's the Lord's brother. Oh, wow. Well, well, well so, so you know Paul. And they start to damn Paul with faint praise at first. Paul, oh, yes. We know Paul. <laughs> oh, how's Paul? He's okay. He, he really means well. <laughs> he loves the Lord. He does. He really does love the Lord. Oh, 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 what's wrong? And their faint praise descends into all out character assassination. And they rip Paul to shreds. And the ringleader of these men has come to Galatia with a knife, a very sharp knife, because they have an objective. And that is to circumcise all those Gentile brothers and put all of them under the law of Moses. Well, back in Antioch of Syria, where Paul is and Barnabas is, two things happen. One, what the legalist ex-Pharisees had shared with those Gentiles that they have to be circumcised to be saved is really causing a lot of those Gentiles believers to wonder. I mean, they're thinking, well, these guys came from Jerusalem. They had a letter from James. Maybe we are supposed to be circumcised. And so this starts to bubble up to the surface, and the church decides to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem to settle the matter and find out, do the Jerusalem apostles approve of what these men said? Do they agree that the Gentiles need to be circumcised? Let's settle it. This problem came from Jerusalem. We're going to send it back to Jerusalem. So plans are being made for Paul and Barnabas to go to Jerusalem. You can read the story of what happens. It's a big council. It's in Acts 15. But remember, the legalist ex-Pharisees are still in South Galatia. And they have been there for a few months and they're starting to gain the trust of the brothers and the sisters in the churches in Galatia. So Paul gets two letters. He probably got more, but we know of two. One letter is from the brothers in Galatia, the Gentile brothers. A number of them got together from some of the churches and they wrote Paul a letter telling him what's going on, that these men have visited them and are still there and what they're teaching. The other letter comes from Timothy and he's telling Paul what's going on. Well, let me tell you, sisters and brothers, when Paul gets these letters and reads them, he is livid. He really is angry. And he's perplexed. He can't believe it. First of all, he can't believe that these ex-Pharisees would make that trip and do this. But then again, he thinks about it and he says, well, yeah, they probably would, given how zealous they are for the law. But he can't believe that these young churches, they're only one to two years old. They're baby Christians. He can't believe that after the time he spent with them and what he preached to them, that they're actually considering this. And listening to these men. He is disturbed to the depths of his being. And he's upset 
And so he gets some of the brothers in Antioch together, and he explains what's going on, and he tells them how he wants to respond, and then he hires a scribe. And he writes, through dictation to the scribe, the most blistering letter he will ever write in his life. He writes it in white heat. Sometimes he doesn't even finish his sentences. He's so upset. And he gives the letter, the scroll of the letter to Titus, and he asks Titus to go to South Galatia and read the letter to the brothers and sisters in Galatia, Antioch of the city of Iconium, Lister, and Derby. And that is the story behind the book of Galatians in the New Testament. Now, I have some awesome news. Recent archaeological discoveries have dug up two of the letters that the brothers and sisters wrote from Galatia to Paul. The letters that provoked Paul to write Galatians. And only I have access to these two letters. <laughs> Would you like to hear those two letters? <laughs> Would you like to hear it? Okay. We're going to take a 10 minute break. <laughs> it's 10.30 right now. We will meet back here at 10.40. It's 10.28. We'll meet back here at 10.40, and I, for the first time ever, mortal ears will hear these two letters. One of them is from the brothers in the churches in Galatia, the Gentile brothers, and the other one is from Timothy. I'm going to read you the letters, and then we're going to talk some more about Galatians, all right? Ten minutes.